My name is Noah Diffenbaugh. I'm an associate professor in the School of Earth Sciences and Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. We know from uh, many, many different kinds of observations that a number of kinds of extreme events have already increased in their likelihood and or their severity. The clearest signals are uh, extremely hot events, uh, heavy rainfall. Because more rain fell in one day today in Philadelphia than we've ever recorded and records go back into the 1800s. We are seeing an unprecedented flood across many parts of the state of Colorado. Hickory, North Carolina got seven inches or more in just two hours. More than a foot of rain in some spots in less than 24 hours. The weather is increasingly getting stuck. The situation set up here unfortunately looks like it's going to continue. And when a storm stalls, when a storm gets stuck, the result can be incredible rains, extreme rains, and we're seeing this pattern more and more. Uh, there's more warm, moist air flowing into that storm, which invigorates the storm. It's the main fuel, especially for tropical storms and, and hurricanes. We've seen this uptick in the most extreme rains based on NOAA data since about the 1980s. Simple physics, warmer air can hold more water vapor. There's more moisture in the air, especially coming off of the oceans. More jet fuel for these severe thunderstorms and flash floods. There is more energy available in the climate system that has to go somewhere, and so the weather systems have to respond to that. But, uh, the winds may be as high as 195 miles per hour. If that's the case, we're talking about one of the strongest storms in world history. Uh, super Typhoon Haiyan that fed off of record ocean temperature. If you put more heat energy into the air, you've got more energy available to power a stronger storm. So we know that uh, the warmer uh, the ocean surface, the more moisture and more heat that's available to intensify hurricanes and typhoons. The winds in the center of the circulation of this storm are the equivalent of what you would find in an EF3 to EF4 tornado. Not hurricane, but a tornado out here. It's basically a 100 in diameter wide uh, tornado. We know for sure that heat extremes have increased. The number of heat waves and their intensity have grown. We know that when you do happen to get drought in the presence of increased heat, well, that drought's going to be more intense. So in places that have experienced drought, we've seen an increase in the intensity. The, the severe heat that occurred in the United States in the summer of 2012, that kind of event is approximately four times more likely in the current climate than uh, in the pre-industrial climate. The hot spring conditions that occurred in the United States in 2012 are about 10 times more likely. This sort of flood, for instance, in the UK in 2000 we saw, where climate change probably doubled the incidence of this sort of thing happening. Uh, the likelihood of severe thunderstorm, if we do see continued global warming, we're likely to see increases in, in the frequency of those conditions. The sea ice, as of last summer, was three quarters gone. Three quarters of it is gone in just 30 years. You have this big heating it in, in the uh, Arctic area. Th that essentially changes like the jet stream. Well, it, it causes the jet stream to kind of do dips farther down. Whenever you see big storms coming or heat waves, if you look at the jet stream, you'll see these big dips. We are talking about unprecedented temperatures for places like Atlanta. And that's because what you're doing is you're, you're transferring cold air down from the north or warm air down from the south and you're also kind of trapping air masses within these troughs in the jet stream and so you get more extreme heat waves, more extreme storms, more extreme cold. Summers of 1980 and 83 when the jet stream was unusually far north and a persistent dome of hot air built over the nation's heartland could become the norm. But if you're down there on the surface and let's say um, it's a rainy day, that rainy period is going to last longer or it could be a dry period. You know, if it's dry for a few days, it's not a problem, but if it's dry for weeks, then you're starting to talk about drought. We had record melting of Arctic ice last September, and that produced a bubble of unusually warm air at the top of the world, which has displaced the coldest air of winter 
farther south. Some of the coldest air that we have seen in decades, and I know we keep telling you that like every weekend, but this really is the coldest air that we've seen thus far. We right now have this polar vortex. This is brutally cold air from, from the center part of the Arctic. The winds in a counterclockwise direction pushing that brutally cold air all the way as far south as Florida. Right now, all eyes on the storm that is marching across the Midwest and expected to slam the East Coast tomorrow. On the West Coast, we have the opposite problem, no precipitation. The lack of rain has now qualified California for severe drought status. Dry weather is reaching a tipping point for a lot of people as we enter 2014 with no real rain in sight. We have people who are waiting for that big snowfall to go up to this year, to go up to Tahoe, and we're just not seeing it. It's very much consistent with the kinds of patterns that we expect to see happening more of, and it just is all a question of where these waves happen to set up at any given year. Um, but it's, it's the same idea. Once the jet stream gets into one of these very wavy patterns, it's very slow to shift. We have no choice but to address climate change, um, or it will address us. The good news is that we, we know what we need to do. We know a lot of the technologies to do that, and uh, we really just need to put those into action.